Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. And alhamdulillah, nahmaduhu wa nasta'inuhu wa nasta'firu wa na'udhu billahi min shururi anfusina wa min sayyiyat ya'manina may yahdi illahu fala mudinna lahu may yudlin fala hadi lahu wa ashadu an la ilaha illa allahu wahtahu la sharika lahu wa ashadu anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasuluhu صلوات الله والسلام عليه تسليم كثيرا يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن إلا وأنتم مسلمون يا أيها الناس اتقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحدة وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجال كثيرا ونساء واتقوا الله الذي تساءلون به والأرحام إن الله كان عليكم رقيبا يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم أعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يتع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما أما بعض فإن خير الكلام كلام الله وخير الهدى هدى رسول الله صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وسلم وشر الأمور محدثاتها وكل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار أعاذنا الله تعالى من نار جهنم The topic that has been chosen, Ikhwani, is the topic of the Tazkiyat of the Nafs, Tazkiyat and Nafs, purification of the soul, which is a religious obligation that we all have, just as we are fasting in the month of Ramadan and we just pray Salat and Asr, and we have to have Biru Walidain, and we have to go to Hajj and Umar and Zakat. It is wajib upon the individual to try to purify his soul. Allah Azza mentioned in the Quran, "Qad aflaha min zakaha, wa qad khaba min dasah." He will be successful, the one who purifies his soul, and is going to be destroyed, wretched, the one who makes his soul dirty. He doesn't take care of it. And the way the soul is, the fitra of the soul, is that it has been created naturally and is hard to control. And that's why when the Nabi Wasallam explained to us in the authentic hadith that Allah Azza wa created Adam, and before he blew into Adam the spirit of life, Adam was lying on the ground, he was lying there in Jannah, he was 60 cubic feet, meaning he was a giant, 60 of these, if you put 60 of these on top of each other, that's how tall he was. Allah allowed Iblis, Shaytan, to go inside of Adam, and he came out of Adam, and he said about Adam, Inna hadha la yitamadik. This creation, he's going to find it difficult to control himself. So the nature of the soul is that it's like a wild horse, and it is the responsibility of the Muslim man, the Muslim lady, the mother and the father, it's the responsibility of the human being to tie that horse up, to tie that soul up, so to speak. And the way that is tied is by practicing the religion. That's something of what we're going to discuss today, inshallah, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Concerning some of the important issues that came to us from the Kitab and the Sunnah, first of all, about the Tazkiyat of the Nafs, is the fact that Ibrahim, Salawatu Allahi Wasalamu Alayhi, he prayed to Allah Azza wa that Allah Azza wa Jalla would send to his descendants when he left them there in Mecca, someone who would be responsible for purifying their souls. He mentioned, Subhanahu wa ta'ala about the dua of Ibrahim, Rabbi or Rabbana wab'ath fihim rasoolan minhum yatlu alayhim ayatika 
وَيُزَكِّيهِمْ وَيُعَلِّمُهُمْ كِتَابُ وَالْحِكْمَةِ Oh my Lord, send to Ismail and Hajar and the descendants that are going to come to them, these ones that are left in Mecca, send to them a messenger from themselves who's going to يَرْحَمَقُوَّةِ who's going to read unto them your ayat and they're going to give them, he's going to give them the tazkiyah of the nafs and he's going to teach them the kitab and the hikmah, the sunnah. So Ibrahim made dua to Allah Azza wa that he would send someone to his progeny to make the tazkiyah of their anfus. And Allah Azza wa answered that dua as he mentioned in the number of ayat of the Quran. From those ayat is in Surah al Juma that the Prophet used to read Sallallahu Alaihi on Friday in the Khutbah al Juma or after the Khutbah al Juma. Who will never be a fair ummi jina rasul and minhum yet to do alayhim ayatihi where you said kihim where you alimum and kitabu and hikmah when canon and kabul and fi dolaran mubi. Allah is the one who sent to them a messenger. He sent to the illiterate people a messenger from amongst themselves. He reads unto them the ayat of Allah and he purifies them. He gives them tazkiyat of their anfus and he teaches them the kitab and the sunnah. So that is Allah's istijaba of the dua of Ibrahim. And it goes to show the importance of the issue of tazkiyat al nafs. In addition to that, khwani, the Prophet وسلم, informed us about what his whole da'wah is about when he said, I have been sent with the sole purpose of completing the good character. So his da'wah, his deen, is a deen that as this little man grows up and he practices it, this religion, the religion is designed that the Prophet brought as Dawah Sunnah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, was designed to complete the Makar al akhlaq And Allah said about him in the Quran, Wa inna kana ala khuluqin aadhim. You yourself, Muhammad, you are on a high stature of character. Now, Mother Aisha said, He was the Quran. What you see in that Quran telling people what to do, what not to do and all of the khayr of that Qur'an, it was embodied in the real life of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Then if we look at his companions, from what shows us the importance of the tazkiyat of the anfus, is what Allah described them in many ayat of the Qur'an. Muhammad Rasulullah wal ladina ma'ahu wa shidda'u wa al-kuffari ruhama'u bainahum. Muhammad is the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And those who are with him, they are severe with the non-Muslims and they are merciful towards the believers. And both of those characteristics are positive characteristics. To be severe with the non-Muslims in a proper way, in his proper place. I don't have time to divert into that, but it should be made clear, this ayat does not mean that the Muslim doesn't buy into social cohesion, he doesn't buy into coexisting with non-Muslims, it doesn't mean that you spit on non-Muslims and you act in an anti-sociable way. Those people who fight against Islam, those people get problems against Islam, they may do it, they're dealt with a particular way. They're dealt with a particular way. I don't want to make this a political discussion, but I'm amazed, I'm amazed that at the beginning of Ramadan, some people could see this statement of Obama talking about Ramadan. And he mentions the word Ramadan and Ramadan Mubarak, and he says, Prophet Muhammad this, and he says, he came with the word Iqra, and Muslims see them and they say, whoa, 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 whoa. But at the same time, the policies that they push are having Muslims burnt alive in Palestine, in Gaza having the whole Gaza Strip bombed to smithereens. So the Muslim has to have some kind of, some kind of, you know, intelligence. From good akhlaq is being intelligent and not being a knucklehead. Someone who can be fooled by any kalam that someone says. So the meaning of 
those companions are rough with the disbelievers, doesn't mean what some Muslims understand, killing people in the street, blowing up, killing, that doesn't mean that. It means those people who oppose Islam, Allah mentioned in the Quran, مَا يَنْهَاكُمُ اللَّهُ عَنِ الَّذِينَ لَنْ يُقَاتِلُوكُمْ فِي الدِّينِ Allah doesn't prevent you people from those who don't fight you in your religion. They don't fight you in your religion. They don't put you out of your homes. Allah doesn't prevent you from and the baruhum wa tuqsitu ilayhim in Allah you have You feel just with that. The Prophet was gentle and just and kind with non-Muslims. But those people who oppose Islam, Abu Lahab, Abu Jahl, Mayyid ibn Khalaf, and those people, Imams of Kufr, those companions were tough with them. And they were ruhama between themselves. They had mercy for the youngsters, for the elders, for the women, for themselves, for the one who made a mistake, for the sinner. They had mercy for them. They supported each other. That's how the companions were. When Nabi Yusuf described his companions and the Muslims in this ummah, but especially those companions, مثل المؤمنين في توادهم وتراحمهم وتلاطفهم كمثل الجسد إذا اشتكى منه عظم تداء له سائل الجسد بالحمى والسهر. The example of the believers in their love for one another, in their gentleness towards one another, in their mercy towards one another. It's like that of a single body. If one part of the body aches, then the whole body is going to suffer from sleeplessness and from fever. And that's how those companions were, radiallahu anhum ajma'in. From what shows us the importance of tazkiyah to nafs is what the ulama of al-Islam did, especially the ulama of the sunnah, the ulama of al-hadith, and that they used to write those books about the aqidah, the minhaj of al-Islam, the correct aqidah, the correct belief system. Individual on this Sunday, the second Sunday in this year's Ramadan, we fasted one week. Someone fasted seven days already, and he actually thinks and he believes, he thinks and he's believing that he's gonna get a lot of rewards, but the aqidah that he has is a bit jammed up. And there are many things, that, well, I mean, many things that a person can do that will destroy his deeds. And there are many things that if he doesn't do it, it will destroy his deeds. So I work and you brothers work and I work for the masjid. I come to the masjid for my check at the end of the month. And when I get my check, they give me half of my earnings. They give me a quarter, I worked 40 hours this week. At the end of the week, I go to get my money. The message decided to give me 20 hours worth of my check. And I sweat it. And that money has to go to my children, pay my bills, and so forth. If I said to them, where's my money? And they started giving me a hard time. And that message, I'm going to pick the table up at the office. I'm going to say, where's my money? You people, where's my money at? And that's my house. Because you're going to do it the same way. You're going to be the same way. Because that's your heart. What about the deeds? The person is fasting all these days. He'll come Yom Qiyamah. And when he goes to get the reward, the check is nothing. Because he's doing something that he shouldn't be doing. Or he's not doing something that he should have been doing. And they are many. Today's discussion is not about that. And that's why Allah has really revealed so many ayat, not one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, more than 10 ayat, warning people up, doing a lot of works, and at the end of the day, your works will be rendered null and void. And there are a lot of things. The top of the list, shirk and kufr. Ya Rasulullah, Rasulullah's hazir nazir. Rasulullah knows the ilm al ghayb Rasulullah didn't die. Magic, all of that hocus pocus that people were taking as the religion of Allah's religion will render your deeds null and void. مَثَلُ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا بِرَبِّهِمْ أَعْمَالَهُمْ كَرَمَادٍ إِشْتَدَّتْ بِهِ الْرِيحِ فِي يَوْمٍ عَاصِفٍ لَا يَقْتِرُونَ مِمَّا كَسَبُوا عَلَى الشَّيْءِ ذَلِكَ هُوَ الضَّلَالُ الْبَعِيدِ Those people who disbelieve in their Lord, their deeds, their actions are like ashes. Ashes. 
on a day when there's a big whirlwind. When that whirlwind comes, that whirlwind will knock this building down. Will knock this building down. Will pick up a truck and fling that truck all the way to London. What do you think is going to be the case with these ashes? It comes and it blows those ashes away to the point where the person won't be able to benefit from what he put forth. Why? Because he made kofr, shirk. Someone is fasting, he's fasting, making jihad, and praying taraweh, and giving him sadaqa fi sabini that. But at home right now, his mother and his father are upset with him, and he's upset with them. During the course of the day, he's arguing with them, they're arguing with him. Some of us, we cut them off. We only want to hear about them, they don't want to hear about us. And he's fasting all day. Rasulullah mentions sallallahu alayhi wa sallam thalathatun. La yaqbalu Allahu ta'ala minhum sarfam wa la adla. Three people Allah won't accept from them any of their deeds. The wajib deeds or the sunnah deeds. Very first person he mentioned, aaq walidayhi. The one who is disrespectful to his power. And he's fasting. So the point is, many issues will destroy a person's fast. Some man came, he said, Ya Rasulullah, if I said La ilaha illallah, and you are Rasulullah, if I pray five times every day, and I fasted the month of Ramadan, and I gave zakat, and I made hajj to Allah's house, what reward would I get? He said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, for who my ladina, for who my nabiyin, was siddiqeen, was shuhada. Anyone who does those five things, he's going to be with the prophets. He's going to be with the Siddiqin. He's going to be with the Shuhada, the martyrs. He'll be raised up with them. Except for the one who is disrespectful to his parents. So there are many issues, many issues like that. The point, the point here is the Aqidah. How do we know the importance of Tazkiyat al nafs The scholars of the past, scholars of the Sunnah, scholars of the Hadith, they used to write books about the correct aqidah. Many of you know more a lot of those books. So Sula, Sunnah, Imam Ahmed, and these kinds of books. Sheikh al-Islam ibn Utaymi wrote a book called Al-Aqidah al-Wasatiya. And in that book, in the last chapters of that book, he brought from the aqidah and the minhaj of the people of the Sunnah is good akhlaq. And he gave some examples of those akhlaq. So it's kind of like that oxymoron, it's a real serious contradiction that people who claim a connection to the Sunnah are sometimes the roughest, toughest people in our behavior. Some people are connected to the Sunnah, there's no Rahmah in the way we deal with people. And the Sunnah, they're the most knowledgeable people concerning Allah, where he is, where he isn't, what he does, what he doesn't do, his name's attributes. And and the Sunnah are the most merciful people to the khalq of Allah. They are gentle, they are easy. From what shows the importance of the Tazkiyat al nafs as well is, again, the scholars of Al-Islam, the scholars of the Sunnah, scholars of Al-Hadith, they used to write books specifically about this issue. Like the famous Kitab, many of them wrote Kitab al-Zuhd, al -Zuhd, how to be a person who is not really into the dunya, or how to exist and not allow the dunya to be in your heart, but to be in your hand. Those scholars used to write those books like that. Why? Because they were showing us the importance of Tazkiyat al nafs and Imam Ahmed, and Imam Abdullah bin Mubarak, and Imam al Bayhaqi, Waqir bin Jarrah, many of those Imams. All of that shows and indicates that the scholars took care of that stuff. You know that book that everybody has in his library, Riyadh al Salihin by al Imam al Nawawi. Al Imam al Nawawi. That is a book that shows the importance of Tazkiyat al nafs another scholar. Those books that Al Imam al we wrote, like Kitab al Afkar, How to Make the Dua, that book, uh, The Fortress of the Muslim, most of that is taken from that book of Al Imam al Nawawi, How to Make Dua, Tazkiyat al nafs So the issue is important, and a person should realize that. We have to all make a continued jihad, collectively and individually, communally, in order to, inshallah, azawajal, take care of this wajib that's from the ojib and wajibat that Allah azawajal has put on top of us. What I want to do today, inshallah, because I don't just want to give a talk 
and then I roll out and you people are here and we break out fast, that's it. But I want to get out of here and hopefully continue to get some benefit as a result of this lesson. I want to bring your attention to something that I hope you all can get your heads around it and really buy into it and apply it because in it is a tremendous amount of khayf for all of us. And that is, when we talk about tazkiyat and nafs, everything in this religion came to purify your soul. A tawheed came to purify your soul. Salat came to purify your soul. Zakat, zakat, is, zakat is from tazkiyat. The word is from a tazkiyat itself. It came to purify your money and your soul. Fasting came to do that, and hajj came to do that. All of the ibadat of al-Islam came to do that. So I want to focus, inshallah, on one issue, one aspect, bring to your attention, because the month of Ramadan, in order to just try to get you to see the importance of this issue and to apply it as well. And that is, now that we're in the month of Ramadan, it's only appropriate that we deal with the issues that are connected to the ahkam of Ramadan. And one of the hukums from the ahkam, one of the rulings of Ramadan that we should neglect is this issue of the taraweeh prayer and the role that a taraweeh prayer plays in tazkiyat and nafs. Now the five prayers in al-Islam, ikhwani, the five prayers in al-Islam, they purify you, they purify you. The Prophet, he mentioned sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, as-salawatu khams, wal jum'atu ila jum'ati, wa ramadanu ila ramadan, the five prayers that you made Fajr, Dhur, Asmad, Isha, the Juma to the next Juma, one Ramadan to the next Ramadan, they are expiations. If you stay away from the major sins, one Ramadan to the other Ramadan, it's fasting, will wipe away your sins. They will clean you up. Tazkiyah. The five prayers that you make, tazkiyah, when you make wudu and the water falls off of you, that is purifying you. Each water that falls off you or drops, tazkiyah. Walk into the masjid, right foot is a hasana, left foot is a sayyah taken off of you, tazkiyah. So the hadith goes to show praying, those five prayers, they are a tazkiyah of your nafs. Allah mentioned in the Quran and ayah, that was revealed because of a man from the companions who kissed his wife while he was fasting and he felt some kind of way about it. When he went to complain to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Allah revealed an ayat in the Quran. He said, he kissed his wife, shahla, shahla, desire. It goes against the tazkiyat of the nafs. He kissed his wife while he was fasting. We gotta avoid that. He kissed his wife while he was fasting. He went and complained. Allah revealed the ayah and told him what? Allah said, establish the salat during the daytime. Dhuhr, asr, fajr, during, during those three hours, those salats during the daytime. And also establish the salat part of the night, mother and Isha. He said, verily, the good deeds, the salat, it wipes away the, the sayyiat, the bad deeds. And this is a dhikra to the dhakirin. This is a reminder to people who want to be reminded. So the man, he fell into something of the shahwa, and the eye of the Quran was revealed telling him, if you want to clean that up, clean it up, the effects of it, avoid it, then it's the prayer. So that's a clear, a little clear proof that the prayer cleans you up. What I want you to do today though, I want you to take those five prayers and put them on the side because we're not talking about them today. Those five prayers will clean you up and they are important. Nothing is more important than them than, other than a tohi. But I want to put all of those five prayers on the side and we're going to talk about the taraweeh and other prayers, other prayers, inshallah, because Unlike the religion, especially for you young brothers, unlike the religion of the Jews and the Christians and the Sikhs and the Hindus, and Islam is not a religion where you pray only once during the day. They pray on Friday, they pray on Sunday, they pray on Saturday, that's it. 
Islam is not like that. You don't just pray on Friday. And even the one who's praying all five prayers, Islam is more than that. The Prophet وسلم, legislated prayers for everything in your life. And a lot of these prayers can be implemented inside of that taraweeh for your own benefit and from your own good. So some of us in the month of Ramadan, if a person doesn't pray the taraweeh prayer, no one can come and say, your taraweeh is not complete, but, or your taraweeh isn't counted, it doesn't count. Can't say that. But you can definitely say you're not praying, you're not fasting the Ramadan that the Prophet legislated Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It's like the one who doesn't give in this month. They described Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and they said, He used to be the most generous person. And he became more generous in the month of Ramadan. So if you came to him and you asked him for something, he didn't say to you, no. If he didn't have it, he would say, can I have that? And then he'll take it from you and give it to you and say, I owe you. He didn't say no. He said no to things that were haram. He said no when he took to shahada, la ilaha illallah. But when it came to giving people, if you asked him for something, he was generous. And he was more generous in Ramadan. And that's how the Arabs were in Jahiliyyah. They were people who were generous, generous, karo. So when the Nabi was chosen to be from them, this quality jumped off of the page. So the companion described him and said in Ramadan he was more generous when Jibril would come to him and read the Quran. So the person who's not reading the Quran in Ramadan, if he didn't read the Quran in Ramadan, his fasting could be accepted, no problem. But he didn't fast the complete fast. If he's not being more generous in Ramadan with his money, his wealth, his time, his effort, there's something wrong with that situation, that equation. The salat is from that issue as well. The salat of the taraweeh. So if you're an individual who you're not coming to the masjid to pray the taraweeh, or you yourself, you're not getting up to pray more prayers by yourself during the day, but especially during the night, then that's not the complete taraweeh. So I'm going to give you some things, inshallah, in today's discussion about tazkiyat to nafs and nafs from the taraweeh that hopefully will be an encouragement and also, would also hopefully, because we're fasting so many long hours, it'll be something that'll help you to focus and to have more incentive to be in that taraweeh. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, as I mentioned, he used to pray and make up prayers for everything connected to the life of the Muslim. In the Battle of Al Ahzab, the Battle of the Ahzab, the Confederates, there's a surah of the Quran called Al Ahzab. All of the Arabian Peninsula, all of the Kufab Quraysh and their allies came together to extinguish the light of Islam. First time it ever happened in the history of the Arabs. So when they came to Al Medina in order to attack the Muslims, Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam being a thinking man, he had his feet on the ground, he had common sense, he said, look at our ummah, look at our city, and look at the numbers of these people. It's not in our best interest, although Allah is with us, the Mala'ika will be with us, it's not in our best interest to engage in an attack this, to, in this fight with them. So, showing his humility, he said, what do you people think we should do? Salman and Pharisee from Persia, say, Ya Rasulullah, up in Persia, if we used to have a formidable foe and they outnumbered us the way we're outnumbered, we would just dig a ditch. And then that would kind of even and level off the playing field. The Prophet took the advice of Salman al Farisi showing his humility, the importance of Shura, showing he's not Hazar Nazir al Milghay. He would have known what the people of Persia were doing without asking Salman al Farisi. He would have known that if he knew the al Milghay. He said, That's a good idea. So they built the ditch, and they built it in time before the non Muslims came. After the ditch was built, Rasulullah said to one of his companions, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Al-Hudayf ibn al-Yaman, 
He said to, uh, Huday, to Hudayfa, hey, Hudayfa, you, 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 I want you to go over there and spy on those people. I want you to cross the ditch at nighttime and spy because I want the news of the people. Hudayfa, he didn't say, what are you sending me for? Why are you sending me? Hey, Juan, let's deal with these telephones. I mean, just, everybody just turn your telephone and mobile off right now, inshallah, we don't have to deal with that. He didn't ask him, why are you sending me? He just got up and he went over there. And he spied for Rasulullah, he saw the light, he sent him on those kuffar. He found out what their numbers were looking like. He found out the mentality, the point of view that they had. He found out their spirit, what they were trying to do, when they were planning their attack and so forth and so on. And then he came back. He said, and this is the shahid, this is the point. He said, when I came back, I saw the Prophet praying, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he said about that, كان رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم إذا حزبه أمرهم صلى If something bothered him, he would pray. If something was bothering him, his sunnah was to pray. He heard something that he didn't like. He saw something that he didn't like. Something made him nervous. Alhamdulillah. He صلى الله عليه وسلم would pray. Our mother, our mother. Zayna bintu Jahsh, and what was collected by Imam al-Bukhari. She said that the Prophet was sleeping, he woke up and he said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, La ilaha illallah, wayu min al-Arab, min sharm, iqtarab, futih al-yawm, radu ya'juj wa ma'juj, mithru had. He woke up, he said, La ilaha illallah, woe unto the Muslims, to the Arabs, woe unto you, from the evil that has come close. The wall that is holding back that juj and my juj it has been open like this just like that every day that juj and my juj when the sun comes up they go to that wall and they try to break that wall they try to come through that wall they get it open get it open then the night time comes and then they say we come back tomorrow and they close that wall the, the wall close they come back every day one day is going to be broken when it breaks and they come out some of us who saw those videos on the youtube of the atrocities that were being committed in Syria when that war first began from both sides, from both sides, stabbing the dead body in the head. That drama, that I don't encourage you to watch that stuff. That drama is going to be a walk in the park compared to the fitna of Yajuj and Majuj. So the Prophet was nervous when he saw that. <laughs> Similar hadith is what Um Salama said. رضي الله عنها وأرضاها سمنا حديث. she said that the prophet was sleeping صلى الله عليه وسلم فاستيقظ فزعا and he was afraid. he said سبحان الله ماذا أنزل الله من الفتن وماذا أنزل من الخزائن من يوقن صواحب الحجرات يسلين رب كاسية في الدنيا عارية في الآخرة he said, glory unto Allah, glory unto Allah from the fitna that I saw in my dream. Fitna coming down, so many things are going to happen, like what's happening right now, fitna. And then he said to someone who will go and wake up the ladies who were sleeping in my house, meaning his wives. So if something bothered him, his sunnah was not only that he prayed, not only that he prayed, but he told his family to pray as well. Who practiced that sunnah from amongst the people of the sunnah? Who is, this is his way. He hears something, he has anxiety, he's nervous. He prays and he also tells his wife to pray. Allah mentioned in the Quran, وَأْمُرْ أَهْلَكَ بِالصَّلَاةِ وَاسْتَبْرِ عَلَيْهَا Order your family to pray and order your family and yourself to be patient on that prayer. So that salat and that prayer they are an integral part of the identity of the Muslim. And here comes the importance of the taraweeh. There are many lessons and benefits to be learned in the month of Ramadan. From the lessons is sabr, because we have to be patient, 18 hours fast in the UK. And also the issue of a salat, a salat in, tara, in, in the month of Ramadan. The five prayers and other than the five prayers, as I mentioned, if a person didn't increase his salawat in the month of Ramadan, 
I don't say his Ramadan is batil, but he didn't fast a complete Ramadan. He didn't fast a complete one because there are too many other things. As sabr and salah from the most important aspects of the Ramadan. So Allah Azza wa Jalla has commanded in the Quran, Ya ayyul ladina amin usta'inu bis sabri wa salah. Inna Allah ma'as sabirin. Oh, you who believe, seek Allah's assistance for what you're trying to do. You have problems, seek Allah's help by being patient and by praying. Another ayah said, وَاسْتَعِينُوا بِالصَّبْرِ وَالصَّلَاةِ وَإِنَّهَا لَكَبِيرَةٌ إِلَّا عَلَى الْخَاشِعِينَ الَّذِينَ يُظُنُّونَ أَنَّهُمْ مُلَاقُوا رَبِّهِمْ وَأَنَّهُمْ إِلَيْهِ رَاجِعُونَ Seek Allah's assistance for what you need by being patient and by praying. And verily it's difficult except for the people who have al-khashya, al-khushur, those people who they think, they believe, they know they're going to meet their Lord and to him is the final return. So look what happened with our Nabi concerning these prayers, ikhwan. Number one, in the battle of Badr, the companions were going to meet the enemies tomorrow, they were going to eat meet them tomorrow. Ali ibn Abi Talib said, everybody fell asleep and this incident and this issue is in the Quran, in Surah Ali Imran. Everybody fell asleep and they're going to fight tomorrow. That's from the Makaram and Akhlaq. That's from being brave. That's from having Quwwat al Iman and Quwwat al Yaqeen. That tomorrow you're going to meet your enemy and you may get killed. And the enemy, their numbers, are larger than you threefold and you can go to sleep some of us if we have a job interview tomorrow we don't sleep well you don't sleep well you have a an exam tomorrow you don't sleep well their lives were on the line Ali said everybody went to sleep everybody went to sleep except the Prophet he said Rasulullah he prayed to Raka facing a tree he didn't pray to the tree, the niyat wasn't praying for the tree, to the tree, but he prayed towards the tree as a sutra. As I mentioned the last time that I was here, you have the law when you pray. You have to put something in front of you that will serve as a barrier between you and the people who are not praying. You and the jinn that you can't see. So that when you make sajda, no one will walk between you and your sutra. It could be the wall, it could be the table, it could be a chair, it could be that thing back there. The important thing is don't stand up and just pray in the middle of the room. So the Prophet prayed towards the sutra, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, two rakat. After praying two rakat, Ali ibn Abi Talib said, he put his hands up like this, and he stretched them out, and his thing fell off, and he made the dua. He said to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in that dua, Allahumma in tuhlik hadihi al-fi'atu min al-nas fa'innaka len tu'abada ala wajhil ar. If these group, my group of companions, if this small group of people, if we're killed, if we lose, if we're destroyed, you won't be worshipped on the face of the earth. You won't be worshipped. That's one. Rasulullah made that salah. He made the dua to Allah after making two rakats. The second incident. The companion, Uthman ibn Hanif, and what was collected by Imam ibn Majah, he said that a blind man came and he said, Ya Rasulullah, Udu'u'ah, li, and you afiyani. Ask Allah to cure me, make me able to see, make dua for me. The Prophet said to him, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, in shit akhartu wa huwa khayrun laka, wa in shit doubt, qala raju bal udu'uli. He said, if you want, I won't make dua, and that's better for you. Be patient, it's better for you. Not to ask this, ask that. Ben, you just have to walk, be patient. And if you want, I'll make dua for you. The man said, no, make dua for me. The Prophet told him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, make a good wudu. A wudu where you get all of the body parts, the wudu where you don't waste the water, the wudu where you do one or two or three times, you do it correctly. Don't do stuff that's not legislated. Make a good wudu and then pray two rakat. And then you make dua to Allah Azza wa Jalla. The scholars of Islam, 
again, like Sheikh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah, he has a book that's called Kitab al-Tawassu wal-Wasila, the book of how to make a tawassu, to make the correct tawassu. He brings these two hadith in that book, and he said, these two hadith show the legislation, the mashru'iyah of the salat called Salat al-Hajjah. Salat al-Hajjah is from the sunnah for the slave. If he has something that he needs, she has something that she needs to make Salat al-Hajjah. What is it? Two good, one good wudu, two rata'at, and then to make dua for that need. And you know, most of you, I don't know your names in this masjid, but everybody here is in need of something. Everybody, without a doubt, without a doubt. Allah mentioned in the Quran, Ya ayyuhal nas, antum al-fuqara'u ila Allah, wallahu al-ghaniyu al-hameen. You people are poor to Allah. Allah is al-ghani, Allah is al-hameen. Al-faqir is the one who is muhtaj, he's in need of something. You have that lady, you have that lady, She's trying to give the tarbiyah of her children, but it's difficult. They don't listen. Too many of them, and they don't listen. She wants to teach them how to behave and how to be, but it's difficult. She has another child. The child has colic, so he's screaming, crying all the time. It's difficult. Everybody. That guy, he's trying to get his driver's license. He failed the driver's test five times already. Five times. He has a need. Him, that guy over there, his visa papers, you know, his, 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 uh, his immigration papers, issues. Everybody here, he has not a need, but needs. He wants to get married, he wants to move, he's having it, everybody. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, he legislated this salat for the person who was in need. The salat of the taraweeh, the salat of the taraweeh can be used for salat al hajj and that his niyyah can be, I'm going to pray these two rata'at of taraweeh, and this is my need. He prays those two rata'at, and he makes dua to Allah for that particular need, as, as there's nothing in the deen that will prevent that particular issue. And not only that, Ikhwani, not only that, not only did the Prophet Wasallam legislate this particular prayer, but some of the ulama, said that some of the prophets and the messengers also prayed Salatul Hajjah. Like in the story of Ibrahim and his wife Sarah, Salawatullahi Wasalamu Alayhima. When Ibrahim sent his wife into the king and he told the king that Sarah was his sister and the king wanted to do something with her and to her and Allah protected her. Some of those scholars of Islam, like Imam Ibn Kathir ibn Rajab, other than them, they said that there are some narrations where Ibrahim made salat while the lady went in there. And she made salat before she went in there. And Allah Ta'ala protected her. In the Quran, in Surah Ali Imran, the story of Zakariyah, when he saw the miracle of Maryam, that she had the risk in her room, and he didn't know where did it come from. And Maryam said, it came from Allah. Allah gives whatever he wants. When Zakariya saw that, he made salat, asking Allah Ta'ala to give him a child. That was his need. And Allah Azrael gave him the child. So the point is, that salat is a salat that shouldn't be something that the Muslim is not aware of. In the month of Ramadan and outside of the month of Ramadan. So the Prophet legislated that sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam as a means of Get in the things that you want, and from those things is obviously if the person is relying on Allah to that degree, it's going to have some impact and effect on his tazkiyat and nafs. Similar to that, Ikhwani, from what is really vital, from the prayers that the Prophet legislated, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that can be utilized in this month doing the taraweeh as well as what Jabir bin Abdullah mentioned, radiallahu anhuma. What was collected by Imam al-Bukhari, Jabir ibn Abdullah, he said that the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told the people again, and when you need something, إِذَا هَمَّ أَحَدُكُمْ بِالْأَمْرِ فَلْيَرْكَعْ رَكَعْتَيْنِ غَيْرِ فَرِيضًا ثُمَّ لِيَقُولْ اللَّهُمَّ إِنِّي أَسْتَخِرُكَ بِعِلْمِكَ وَأَسْتَقْدِرُكَ بِقُدْرَتِكَ وَاسْأَلُكَ مِنْ فَضِلِكَ الْعَظِيمِ فَإِنَّكَ تَعْلَمْ فَإِنَّكَ تَقْدِرُ وَلَا تَقْدِرُ وَتَعْلَمْ وَلَا عَلَمْ وَإِنْتَ عَلَّامُ الْغُيُوب
Era akhi. If any of you Muslims want to do something in your life, if you want to do something, then make two rakat other than the two rakat that are obligatory. Not the Fajr prayer, not the Juma prayer, not the Eid prayer. Any prayer that has two units and it's not obligatory, any, they have two, any two, like the Taraweeh, any two. Make those two rakat, and then make the dua of an istikhara. Again, it's an example of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sallam teaching the community how to get the things that you need by making salat to Allah Azza wa Jal. Again, we should not look ikhwani at the salat of a taraweeh as an added taklifa from the month of Ramadan. Like right now we have to fast 18 hours and that's some taklifa, it's going to require some effort. It's a long time, 18 hours. Something we have to do, you have to carry on your shoulder. Don't look at the taraweeh as an added, an additional taklifa, but instead, it should be looked at as an opportunity. Because the individual, again, as I mentioned, he can increase his concentration, his commitment, and his performance of the taraweeh, especially when he has that added niyat of the reason why I'm doing this is because I really need this thing and I really need that thing. And as a result of that, his mind won't be wandering off in space and it's just an issue of him hearing the Quran being recited and he's moving up and down with the Imam. But he has more commitment and he's plugged in more to those two units of those raka'at because it means that much more to him. From the prayers that the Prophet وسلم, especially for you young people, show that as the Muslim, our identity is, we're not a group of people who just pray on Friday. We don't wait just one day to pray. We don't just pray for something or something like you have a catastrophe. Everything in Islam, there is a prayer to pray for everything. The Prophet's son, he died. Ibrahim, radiallahu anhu. Ibrahim lived for 18 months, 18 months, and then after 18 months he died. And this is important for many reasons because it goes to show Rasulullah was a human being. He didn't have the ability, he didn't have the life and death in his hands. He doesn't deserve to be worshipped at all. If some harm was going to come to him, he couldn't push it off. If there was some benefit to be derived, he, by himself, he couldn't bring it to himself. His uncle, he was given his uncle Dawah to come to Islam, his uncle died on Kufr. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa couldn't help his uncle. He was dealing with the Kufar of Quraysh, the battle of Bukhid. Someone threw something, they hit him in his head and split his head open. Another person hit him in his face, knocked his tooth out. He became angry and he said, كَيْفَ يُفْرِهُ قَوْمُ شَجُّ رَأْسَ نَبِيِّهُمْ وَكَسْرُ رُبَعِيَّةَ How can a people ever be successful who broke their prophet's head? How can you be successful if you broke your prophet's head and you knocked his tooth out? The next day in Salat al-Fajr, he made the Fajr and after completing the two recitations, he made Rukul, came up, he raised his hand up and he started cursing some of the kuffar by their names. Oh Allah, curse this one and curse that one and curse this one and curse that one and curse this one and curse that one. The, the ones who broke his head and broke his tooth. Allah Azza wa revealed some ayahs of the Quran saying him to him, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, لَيْسَ لَكَ مِنْ الْأَمْرِ شَيْءٍ أَوْ يَتُوبَ عَلَيْهِمْ أَوْ يَعَذِّبُهُمْ you don't have anything to do with it, Ya Muhammad. Uh, they want you brothers to move forward, please. What's the matter? Something happened? Oh, oh, oh. oh. Yeah, then move forward, man. They're ready to get ready for this iftar, man. So the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Ikhwani, he did not have the ability to benefit himself or to harm himself. So clearly that's a clear indication that he, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, doesn't deserve to be worshipped. Shouldn't make dua to him other than that. When his son died, when his son died, 
In the middle of the day, the moon came between the earth and the sun and it eclipsed and it went dark. That's something that doesn't happen every day. It's a phenomenon. When it happens anywhere, it's a phenomenon. It's going to cause Ben Adam, even if they don't have any deen, to pay attention to the environment. When that happened, the people said, oh, oh, oh. It happened because the prophet's son died. This thing happened because the prophet's son died. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Rasulullah could have taken advantage of that opportunity. He knows that the people love him. He knows that the people have ikhlas to Allah. They love him. He could have taken that as an opportunity to take money from them, to raise his status even higher. He could have done that. But he wasn't like that. His dawah was not dawah to himself. His dawah was always to make sure that the people were focused on Allah. His dawah was always turn the people's attention to Allah. He is the medium that if you follow his sunnah, you'll know how to get to Allah. But he never said, look at me, look at me, look at me. He never did that. And every time the opportunity presented itself, he stopped it. When they used to go overboard with him, he would stop it and say, don't call me that, don't say that. I'm just a human being. My mother was a human being that eats this and eats that. So when that eclipse happened, he told the people, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, in the shams of al-qamr, ayatani min ayatillah, la yankasifani li mawti ahadim wa la li hayati. إنما يخوف الله بهما عباده فإذا رأيتم ذلك فصلوا وادعوا حتى ينكشف ما بكم. He told the Muslims, this community, the sun and the moon, they are two ayat from the many ayat of Allah. They do not eclipse for the death, for the death, the death or the life of anyone. This didn't happen because my son died. He said, verily, they eclipse because Allah Ta'ala uses them to make his slaves afraid, to make the people realize, hey, look, look what's going on. This is how it's going to be similar to this Yom Al-Qiyama. Hey, you weren't put here just for nothing. This phenomenon deserves that you pay attention to it in your life. Allah uses it as a means to make the dhikr to the people. He says, so if you see it, if you see it happening, then what you should do is, you should pray, and you should make dua until it goes away. After he prayed those two rakat, after when that happened, he prayed two rakat with the community, and then he gave them a khutbah, a sermon. And he told the people, don't sin, because when you sin, when you sin, Allah Azza wa Jal, he... So the point is that the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi wa Wasallam informed the people that phenomenons and incidents like this concerning the life of the Muslim, the salat is something that is not just legislated for the five prayers in the day, it's just not legislated for the Friday or the Eid, it's something that's legislated every time something happens. Ibrahim died, so when someone dies in Al Islam, we pray over them the salat of Al Janazah. Something happens, there's a salat. With Ibrahim, though, for your information, the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did not, and I repeat, he did not pray the Salat of al Janazah over his son. So some of the ulama are of the opinion, if an infant dies, if a baby dies, you don't have to pray Salat of al Janazah over that baby. But if a grown Muslim dies and it is from Kifaya, some of us have to pray over that individual. Since he didn't pray over his child, then it shows that the infant, you don't have to make the janazah. So some of us, we know people who their children died after being born, the child died in the hospital, you have to go through all of this stuff. Should I get the baby? What should I do? How should I do it? This, that, this, that. I have to make arrangements to get. In Al-Islam, if it's easy for you to do that janazah, you can do it. But the Prophet Wasallam did not make a janazah for his own son, for his own son. So it's not something that's wajib to do the janazah for the child, but they should be buried the correct way. Shouldn't just leave them in the hospital like that 
and let them burn the baby or the, 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 the body of the baby. That's something that shouldn't be done. From what he used to legislate, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that almost jumped the gun was, when it used to rain, the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used to pray the Salat of Al-Istisqa, again showing us that the prayer in Al-Islam, Ikhwani, is something that connects the Muslim to his Lord in all aspects of his life. The Salat of Al-Istisqa is when in Al-Medina, it didn't rain a lot. So the land became scorched and parched and it was really hot and it hadn't rained for an extended period of time. The people complained to the Prophet that their animals were dying and their crops were dying. Please make dua, let's do something about it. The Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he prayed two rakat, asking Allah for the rain. Two rakat. And then after praying the two rakat, he got on his member, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he gave a khutbah to the people telling the people that they should feel Allah and leave off sins because the sins is one of the things that Allah Ta'ala holds back his ni'mah from the people, especially the rain. And then after giving the khutbah, if he had a hat on his head like this, this hat like this, he would take that hat that he was wearing that way and he would turn it inside out, turn it the other way. If he had a cape, a robe, a cape, he would take that and turn it inside out and wear it the other way. Scholars gave different interpretations and different reasons for that. He saw Allah, what he was said of, they said was an optimistic person, not a pessimistic person. If he went to the Eid prayer, he went down that street, and instead of coming back on the same street, he would go to the other street and come down a different street. They said these two incidents are similar. Why did he do that? They gave different reasons. Some of them said the reason why he did that, turned his stuff inside out, is because of his optimism. That before we prayed this this, this bar for the rain, the salat for the rain, there was no rain. Now when we change our thing inside out, inshallah our condition is going to change. I go down this street going to the musalla of the Eid or going to the masjid for the Eid and I'm going to come down another street as if he's symbolically saying, I'm going and when I return, I'm returning a different person, a person who benefited from the fast of Ramadan. So he was an optimistic person. He wasn't pessimistic. If you give him a glass of water, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he would say that that water was half full. He wasn't the type of individual who said to the children, to his companions, to people, you never do anything good. You won't amount up to anything. You're such a problem. He wasn't that type of person. The lady came. He asked that lady, what's her name? And every question that he asked someone, what's your name? Whose camel is this? Whose rope is that? Where did you come from? Every time he asked a question, Salman ibn al-Farisi, what did you do in Persia when you had an enemy this size? Every time he asked a question, that question goes to show He doesn't know the end of the So he said to that lady, what's your name? That lady said, my name is Asiya, the disobedient one. I'm disobedient. That's what they called me. The prophet said, no, no. Your name is Jamila. He didn't like that type of that type of name. It's just her name. She's not Asi, inshallah. She's a person trying to worship Allah. I love Allah. But he was an optimistic person. That's the point. And the reason why we're mentioning that, Khwani, is, again, it goes to show clearly that from his sunnah is, from his religion is, the prayer, the prayer, the prayer is an issue that is not just to be done once, and it also is not those five prayers by themselves. But if the person did only the five prayers, inshallah, it's gonna be okay, inshallah, it's gonna be okay. It's gonna be okay. But how could he, how could he like afford all of the opportunities and lives which he has prepared in following the Prophet and all of those issues? And it's just too many. Abu Bakr al Siddiq, one of the prayers from the Tarawih. Abu Bakr al Siddiq. He said that the Nabi mentioned sallallahu alayhi wa sallam min abdin yudnibu dhanban thumma yatawadda'u fa yuhsinu al-tuhur thumma yusalli rak'atayn thumma yastaghfir allahu ta'ala li dhalika al-dhanbi illa ghafir allahu ma illa ghafir allahu lahu illa ghafir allahu lahu There is no slave, no slave who makes a sin, he makes a mistake. After making that mistake and after making that sin, 
He makes a good wudu. A good wudu. He made a mistake, he made a sin. He wasn't respectful to his mother, he argued with his mother, his father. He makes a good wudu, and then he prays two raka. And then after those two raka, he asks Allah Ta'ala to forgive him for the sin that he committed, that came to his mind. Anyone who does those things, Allah will forgive him for that issue. Allah will forgive him for that particular issue. Again, Ikhwani, that prayer can be put inside of the individual's Salat of At-Taraweeh in terms of his niyyah. Because the Salat of At-Taraweeh, it doesn't, it's, it's, it's those 13 raka'at that we're making, the 8 raka'at that we're making, whatever they have. Your niyyah can be because you missed Salat of Isha, you came and you joined them, that's your niyyah. Your niyyah can be whatever it wants to be as long as you're doing a prayer that is general that allows you to do it. Like I mentioned, Salat al Istikhara can be put in there. The Salat of al Hajjah can be put in there. The Salat of al Tawbah can be put in there. The issue is, in this month of Ramadan, the person should be increasing his prayers. As we mentioned, the prayers had that ability, the way they were legislated and the role that they play to take away from the person's, from the person's, uh, from the person's mistakes and his dirt. He asked the people if a person had a lake or some water in front of his house and he got in that water five times every day would they remain on his body any would they remain on his body any dirt they said of course not he has the water in front of his house every day gets in the water five times a day they won't remain any of that he said and that is the role of the prayer you pray that prayer five times a day that prayer is going to make the tazkiyah of your nafs if you pray the prayer more than those five times in the day that prayer is going to have the ability to make the tazkiyah of your nafs. So the last time that we were here, we stopped only a few minutes before the salat or the adhan. Now we'll, inshallah, as we stop at this time. What time is the adhan for mother, inshallah? 28, 28. So we'll deal with uh, your questions. If you have any questions, inshallah. Ah, shaheed, shaheed. Are there two rakat that you can make to leave and enter your house? That's authentic from the Sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa ala alayhi wa sallam. He used to make those two rakat. It is thabit. But is it to be protected when you go in and you come out? The hadith didn't mention anything about protection. It's enough to know that it was from the Sunnah sallallahu alayhi wa ala alayhi wa sallam. So that's that. Well, the person who has to pay the fidya, the woman who is pregnant, even if she's in the first month of pregnancy, or the second, third, up to the ninth, the woman who is breastfeeding, she could fast if she wants to because she's strong enough to fast, but she has a baby who's breastfeeding. The old person, man or woman, the person who is sick and they can't fast physically, or fasting is going to exasperate their problem. They have to feed a poor person for each day, and they just feed them for one meal, just one meal. Not two, not three, just one meal, because for the most part, that's all we're taking is one meal in the month of Ramadan. So they feed the poor person one meal. Uh, concerning the issue of kissing the wife, Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa ala alayhi wa sallam was in this masjid and a man came and said, Ya Rasulullah, can I kiss my wife while I'm fasting? He said, yes. Another man came and said, can I kiss my wife while I'm fasting? He said, no. So it seemed to be a contradiction. And the people who call themselves Qur'aniyun, they take these types of examples to make doubt about the Sunnah. 
Because both hadith are authentic. So they say, you see, you see, you see? One is saying this, the other one is saying that. And Allah Ta'ala said in the Quran, if it was from other than Allah, you'll find it much ikhtilaf. So look that this, that, that. The companions didn't do that. They didn't do that. They did what Allah asked them to do, told them to do. Fas'aru ahli dhikr in kuntum la ta'alam. Ask those who know if you don't know. Somebody knows. And that's why those scholars of the past, khwani, they didn't leave any stone unturned. There were ayat of the Quran that seemed to conflict and contradict. There are a hadith of the Prophet وسلم, like this one that seems to conflict and contradict. So what did the scholars do? They came and they brought all of those ahadith together. Mushkil al-Athar to the great scholar of Islam, Abu Jafar al-Tahawi. So when you see that, you go and you read and then you'll explain how do you understand the issue. Instead of being arrogant and saying, I don't want the sunnah, being arrogant and saying, I don't understand, don't be like that. You don't know what somebody else knows. So the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, when Aisha asked him about this issue, he said, "As for the man who I said it was okay, that man was a sheikh. He was old. He could control himself, control the shahwa. As for the man who I said no, he was a youngster. He may not be able to control himself. So the Islam came with something that is called sadd." You have to close the door of the problem before it began. So the scholars said it is makro for the young man to get married in the month of Ramadan. Not haram, it's dislike. Don't do it in the month of Ramadan. You have a problem. So in this case, that's the explanation. As for the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he was a sheikh. He used to control himself. So he would go out to make salat and he was fasting and he would kiss his wife sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sallam because it wouldn't make any shahwa, it was no desires, it was a kiss of affection to show his wife she's loved and he loves her. It's good quality in his akhlaq. So kissing is permissible for the one who can control himself and the one who can't control himself is not permissible, he shouldn't do it. But who from amongst us can control himself? Especially in the month of Ramadan, that's when Shaytan really makes you want to kiss people. That's when he really have you knocking on that door. So just to avoid it altogether. Fadiyah. You mentioned, of course, earlier that from the proofs that the Prophet Muhammad said, doesn't require that the Prophet Muhammad said, doesn't require that the Yeah, these are uh, issues, Ahi, they are situations where people by hook or crook are going to try to prove their points. By hook or crook, they're going to try to prove their points. So the Prophet وسلم, didn't have the ilmul ghayb, and he would ask questions as a proof that he didn't have ilmul ghayb. Allah, he has ilmul ghayb. He has ilmul ghayb, and yet he asks questions to the malaika. And bi uli bi asma'i ha'ulai in kuntum sadiqin. You tell me the names of this, and he was asking the angels question. Not only the angels, but Allah asks Iblis, ma mana'aka in tasjuda bima khalaq tu bi yadayya. Allah is asking Iblis, what prevented you from Make his sajda to the one who I created with my own two hands. So Allah has a little day, but he asks these questions. Why? That goes to show Prophet Muhammad has a little day. Prophet Muhammad has a little day, and he was asking questions just like oh, I would do that. First of all, Allah, as we just mentioned in the Quran, Ma ya'lamu man fi samawati wal ard al ghaybat illallah. No one in the heavens and the earth, no one in the heavens or the earth knows the unseen except Allah. So Allah negated that on everyone except Himself. That's the first thing. Second of all, 
In the hadith of the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, inna awla ma yuhasibu bih al-abd min amari yawm al-qiyamati as-salat. First thing Allah is going to ask the people about yawm al-qiyamati is the salat. He's going to say to the malak, فَيَقُولُ اللَّهُ بِمَلَائِكَتِهِ وَهُوَ أَعْلَمْ أُنْذُرُوا فِي صَلَةِ عَبْدِهِ أَتَمَّهُنَّ أَوْ نَقَسَهُمْ Allah will ask the angels, look at the salat of my slave. And then the prophet said, and he already knows. Allah already knows. He asked them, look at the salat of my slave. And Allah already knows the answer. He already knows the answer. The Nabi said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Ala Ali Wasallam. So Allah is asking the questions are not questions that come as a result of ignorance. Never did the Prophet ask a question and then he said, but I know the answer. Never did he say that. When Jibril asked him, when is the hour? He said, Man anha bi min as The one who's asking the question is, doesn't know, knows the same as the one who's being asked. It's a classic case of people just using whatever they can use to prove their point. That's all it is. <laughs> forbidden times. No prayer should be prayed at the forbidden times. No prayer should be prayed when the sun is coming up or when the moon is going down, if you can avoid it. But as Al Imam al Shafi said, if it is a salah, that is sabab. It's a reason you have to do it, then you do it. For example, you miss salat al fajr. So you miss it by sleeping. When you wake up, you just pray at that moment and the sun is coming up. You miss some prayer and you just remember it and the sun is going down. So you pray because it has a reason, you have an excuse. And the Nabi allowed you to do it, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But all of those other prayers, you shouldn't pray it when it is a time of prohibition like that. Uh, those du'as actually, Salat al istikhara some people said that the du'a is inside, but it is arjah, inshallah, that it should be outside. So where do you make the du'a? When can you make the du'a? Do your best to try to do it as quick as possible. And then, if you're outside of the prayer and they're getting up to pray again, you don't have to catch the takbir to ihram, the Allah Akbar of the Imam, you don't have to catch it. You can make that du'a while he's reading in Fatiha and stuff like that. You understand? Or you choose to do it after four rakat, for an example, when they're going to have a longer prayer. Some of the scholars like Al-Imam Ibn Abdul Bar, he said the reason why in his book at Tamheed, he said the reason why Salat al-Taraweeh, it's called the Taraweeh, is because when the people used to pray back then, Mecca, Medina, they used to take a rest after four rakat. They would take it easy, take a rest after four rakat. So usually that's what's happening everywhere. After four rakat, you find this relaxing. Sometimes someone gets up and talk. Sometimes not. You make the dua at that time. Anyway, talk to God. Certainly, when you're praying the Salat of the Taraweeh and you're holding the Mus'haf, there's something that you shouldn't do, it's something that should not be done, shouldn't be done. You should listen to the Quran as Allah commanded when it's being recited, whether you understand it or not, listen and concentrate on the Book of Allah. And the Sunnah when you're praying is to look at the ground, the place of where you're going to make sajda. And whenever you do something like that, you're going to compromise other aspects of what is legislated, like what all of the prophets and the messengers were commanded to do. And that was to hold your right hand with your left hand, your right left hand with your right hand. So you should be looking at the floor, you should be holding your right hand with your left hand, and you should be listening to the Quran and not following. Especially if he's a hafid and he doesn't need you, or there are other hufar. Now if they're, the guy's not hafid, or he's the only hafid, and one person is doing it out of necessity, we'll do it. Why? Because as the brother mentioned, our mother, Aisha, radiallahu anha, although she memorized the Quran, she used to let her slave boy 
read the Quran and he used to read out of the Mus'haf because he was not a Hafid. He was not a Hafid. So this is something that the normal people in the Musalla should not do. Now. Answering this last question, I'm sorry we didn't get to all of your questions very quickly, inshallah. There's some crazy fatwas going around in London and other than London being issued by people who used to be on the Sunnah. Actually, I used to have Ghibta, you know, Hasid, because the brother translated the book, Sufatul Salat al Nabi. And that's one of the most useful books that a person can read in Islam how to make salat. But then after graduating from Cambridge University and getting a degree with honors from that prestigious university, he started saying that human beings come from monkeys and stuff like that. <laughs> so these people, Ikhwani, these people like that, another the Quilliam Foundation, guys have to be careful of these people because they are, they are the personalities who are going to be used to change the complexion of Islam tomorrow the problems that we have in our Muslim schools where they're saying that we're radicals and we're extremists. They come to Birmingham with the Trojan horse issue, it wasn't even real, and they said that we're radicals. Why? You're extremists. Why? Because boys sit on that side, girls sit on that side. Because the Muslim teacher said, don't draw the genitalia when you draw it. Don't draw. They say, hey, this is not British values. We have to draw the, the, the genitalia. This is art in Britain. So they want to change the complexion of Islam. These little kids, when they grow up to be Muslims, they, go, they want them to say no homosexual is okay. They want them to say that. We say no homosexuality is not okay, but you can't break the law concerning those homosexuals. You can't harm those people. You can't discriminate against those people. You can't so forth and so on. But these guys are giving fatwas and taking positions to help change that thing. So beware of those crazy fatwas that allow you to break your fast at six o'clock. Who in his right mind ever heard of a fatwa that you can, you can fast at night time? You can fast at night time. And in Khwani the Salaf, they used to say, as long as a person is alive, as long as you're alive, you're not safe from al-fitin. You're a Muslim today, you're a Kafir tonight. That's how it is. So the companions, Umar, was afraid for himself of any thought, and he was Umar. And I'm walking around, I'm Salafi. Hey, what are you talking about? Hey, you better be afraid for yourself. Cambridge University, artificial intelligence is the degree, and that leads you to say, uh, Adam, human beings were created from the monkey, and now you can fast during the night and not the day because the hours are too long. So the brother's question is, what if a person is saying, oh, I don't think I can fast today, it's uh, 14, 18 hours, I'm gonna break my fast. First of all, you can't say that. You have to keep fasting. You have to keep fasting. And that's with swas. But maybe the new Muslim says something like that because he came to Islam right now. Oh, I'm gonna break my fast. He says to himself, I'm gonna break my fast, 18 hours. And then he goes home and when he gets home, he decides, no, I'm not gonna break my fast, I'm just gonna, that with swas and that thing that happened, does it affect his fast? Does it, Prophet, that doesn't affect his fast. Prophet told the people, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in an authentic hadith, Allah will not hold you accountable for what's in your mind like that. What your nafs to hadithuka be, what your nafs talks to you about with swas and inside, if you see some craziness, you imagine yourself doing some craziness. Allah doesn't hold you responsible, provided you don't speak about it and you don't act upon it. So as long as he didn't say it, hey, hey I'm going to break my fast. Now he's sinning because he brought casting and ithm and, and ma'asi. And as long as he doesn't do it, it's just wiswas. So let him make an istiana with Allah Azawajal from the shaytan. We're going to stop here, Khwani. Barakallah fikum wa ahsan Allah ilaykum wa taqabbal Allah ta'ala minni wa minkum salih a'mali. Wassalamu alaikum.